What's up people, hope you're having an awesome day. I'm your host Eamon Hassan and welcome back to another video here at Most Amazing Top 10. Now growing up I loved reading about myths and legends, I feel like both are stories you grow up half wishing they were true, half wishing they weren't. So in school I thought myths were reserved to ancient Greece and Rome but as I grew up I realised each country has so many of its own it's ridiculous. So dim the lights, get cosy and let's get into it. This is the top 10 scary British myths. Starting us off at number 10 is the Beast of Bodmin Moor. Located in Cornwall, the Beast of Bodmin Moor is said to be a black panther looking cat that's meant to be 3 to 5 feet long with glowing yellow eyes. A total of 60 sightings of the beast have been reported, as well as people having found a bunch of mutilated slain livestock with no explanation for their deaths. The evidence was so abundant that the government actually launched an investigation looking into the beast but found no further evidence for the cat, but also no evidence against it either. Either. So many assumed it was an escaped cat from someone's private collection and it wasn't reported to authorities because it's obviously illegal. But things really got wild when less than a week later, after the investigation, a boy was walking along River Foy when he found a huge cat skull. The lower jaw was missing but it had two massive canines implying it could have been a leopard. So what kind of 3 to 5 foot cat is lethal enough to kill a leopard? After a lot of investigation, they found the skull was actually from a leopard but it had been imported as part of a leopard skin rug. It had cuts on it showing the flesh had been scraped off with a knife, not another cat's teeth. So that was a dead end, but it still excited people enough to reignite the myth. I mean, not that it really died to begin with, but it was reignited. Coming in at number 9 are boggets. Not the ones from Harry Potter, what a time and a half that would be. No, these ones are either household spirits or they live in fields and marshes. The ones found in houses are known to just cause a lot of chaos. They steal things, they make dogs go lame, they can turn milk sour, sometimes they crawl into your bed and put their hands all over you and despite sounding annoying as hell, they are very loyal to the family they're with. A household boggart follows its family everywhere they go, so at least it'll annoy you for life. You know, like a sibling. Boggarts found outside are a lot more dangerous. They're known to abduct children, kill animals, and all around cause harm. To protect yourself and keep them away, you can hang a horseshoe outside your door or leave a pile of salt outside your bedroom. But the biggest warning is that you should never name a boggart. Once you name it, that's pretty much it. You're done. It can't be reasoned with. You can't persuade it. It just becomes uncontrollably destructive. Looks wise, they look like mini humans with bestial feet. Features. Their arms are extremely long, and despite being small, they're still as strong as a full grown horse, so don't mess with them. At number 8 are the Chime Hours. So, this one got me excited, so you guys better get excited too. Now, this myth originated in northern England, and it's referring to the time of someone's birth. It's believed that people born during particular hours of the day and night have special abilities and are referred to as a Chime Child or Chime Children. Based on what source you're reading from, the abilities you gain when being a Chime child really varies, and the hours that are considered chime hours also vary. According to Charles Dickens, a very, you know, reputable source, it's 12 a.m. exactly. Others claim it's at the hours of monastic prayer, so that's 8 p.m., midnight, and 4 a.m. Either way, regardless of the hours, the abilities are pretty X Men esque. Some people become super perceptive with animals and become able to communicate with them. Some become able to see and speak to ghosts and fairies. Some gain healing abilities, but most of all, being around chime children causes you to lower your guard and speak super openly. So these people basically know a hell of a lot about a lot of people. Chime children definitely, they ain't, they ain't playing around. But there is a catch. It's said that if these people use their powers selfishly instead of to benefit others, they will just perish. I'd honestly love to be a chime child. I need to WhatsApp my mum now and ask her what time I was born. Probably not any of those times, but is to hoping. Filling our number 7 slot, we have the Rat Man of South End, and it's a pretty straightforward myth, honestly. Now, this one is more of an urban legend than a myth, but I feel like in some cases both of those things are synonymous, so just the myth of Ratman goes like this. Years ago, an old homeless man was seeking shelter in the winter and decided to sit in an underpass. A group of teenagers came from nowhere and started beating up the man, nearly killing him. It's said that as he was dying, a bunch of vermin living in the underpass started eating his face. After he finally passed away, many people have reported seeing a ghost in that underpass, whereas others have heard very loud rat-like squealing and large claws moving across the walls. Too big for a normal 
normal rat, but the right size for a rat man. Now at number six is Wayland Smithy. Now Wayland Smithy is a Neolithic chamber tomb and long barren Oxfordshire. Archaeologists say it was built soon after agriculture was introduced to Britain from Europe. But post 1738, it was believed that the site held more than what met the eye. Francis Wise, whoever the hell that is, said that a long time ago an invisible smith used to live at Wayland Smith. As he called it. If a traveller's horse ever lost a shoe on the road, all they had to do was bring the horse and a small bit of money to Wayland Smith and leave both there for a while. Upon their return, the money would be gone and the horse's shoe would be back on. Ever since the myth started circulating, there have been countless coins left at the site with people literally shoving them in there in any crack they can. These days, people from the National Trust remove the coins from the site and donate them to local charities, but the myth lives on. Coming in at Number 5 is Drake's Drum. Now this is more of a historical myth surrounding Sir Francis Drake and if you don't know who he is, he was basically an explorer, sea captain and slave trader during the Elizabethan era. I feel like most people have heard of his name but a lot of people don't actually know what his story is, so there you go. Now it was said that he used to take a drum with him on his voyages around the world. The drum was pretty bougie, it had his coat of arms on it, some silver stud, it was decorative. Either way, the drum was with him on his last voyage and as he was laying on his deathbed, his last wish was that the drum be returned to England and in times of trouble, it should be hit in order to call him back from heaven and rescue the country. Heavy words, Rudy. The drum was then given back to his family, but it's become a huge icon in English folklore. Many say they've heard the drum beating during times of conflict, like when World War I began, or when Napoleon was brought to England as a prisoner, to name a few. Despite it being hit a bunch of times, a resurrected Sir Francis Drake is just nowhere to be found. At number four is Renadine. This was originally in an old ballad called The Mountains High, which basically said Renadine was a were fox that could attract all beautiful women to him, and when they did come, to him, he would kidnap them and take them away to his castle. One day, he encounters a girl in the wilderness and abducts her. And what happens after that point is kind of left open ended, but I'm sure you can imagine all what kinds of horrors would be taking place. Probably just some Netflix and chill. Either way, the myth first started going around as a warning to young girls to not trust charming strangers, which is fair enough, we still shouldn't do that even now, just making it clear. And either way, as time went on, the myth became a lot more magical and a lot less rational. So this one is most likely untrue, but it's still a good story to tell when you know you just want to get some morals across to children. Filling our number three slot are brownies. Not the chocolate kind, but I'm really hungry right now, so I totally wish it was. Damn my bad lunch planning. But either way, like Boggett's, brownies are also household spirits, but they're surprisingly a lot nicer. They usually come out at night and actually perform chores around the house and farming tasks. What more could you ask for, honestly? To keep them happy, all you literally have to do is leave out a bowl of cream or milk for them by the hearth of your house and they'll be happy chappies, really. That's like the best trade deal in the history of trade deals, like to wake up, have your house cleaned all for a bowl of milk. I'm not even mad. I'm not. I'm really not even mad at that. I wouldn't even ask the brownie to pay rent. Just sleep in my bed if you want. Just please clean my house. But it's not all rainbows and butterflies. If a brownie thinks you've offended it or taken advantage of it in any way, it'll leave your house forever and pull pranks on you before it does. Again, if you anger them, they'll turn violent violent and malicious like boggets. Are they distant cousins or something? Looks wise, they're described as ugly, which is just rude, covered in hair and brown skinned. In olden times, they were said to be human sized, but nowadays the myth is that they're a lot smaller, more like an elf. They can even turn invisible and are usually wearing rags or are naked, which sounds very Dobby-like. Now at number two is the Highgate Vampire. This myth was huge in the 70s, I'm talking proper media frenzy. So in the late 60s, a group of occult enthusiasts visited the Highgate Cemetery in London. According to them, they were arranged flowers taken from graves and put in circular patterns, all pointing to a new grave that was uncovered. The coffin was open and the body inside had a huge iron stake in the form of a cross driven straight through the lid and into the corpse's chest. David Farrant, a journalist, claimed he had seen a grey figure in the cemetery one night and 13 other people responded to him saying they had seen something similar. Now the accounts kept saying different things. One said it was a tall man in a hat, a figure going into a pond, others said it was a woman in white, and then Sean Manchester, whoever that is, claimed it was a vampire. So the media went between Sean's story and David's, both competing to see who'd get to the bottom of the story first. Sean even hosted
posted an exorcism in the cemetery and a bunch of hunters showed up swarming the gates. A few months later, a headless charred remains of a woman were found close to where the open grave was. Most believed it was the vampire doing black magic, but no one knows for sure. Regardless of which side of the myth you believe, for the past 25 years numerous, numerous people have claimed seeing a vampire in the cemetery. Are you one of those people? Let me know below. And finally, at number 1 we have Longleat House. The 1000 acre home is home to one of the longest mazes in the world, one of the best safari parks in Europe and gardens for days, but it has a dark past. Back in 1733 the estate was owned by Viscount Weymouth and he soon married Lady Louisa who moved into the house with him bringing with her a bunch of servants. She was quite fond of one of the servants in particular, a footman. Her fondness created jealousy among the other servants which caused them to tell the Viscount that he was having an affair with Lady Louisa. And it's said that wasn't true but I mean I have my doubts. In a fit of rage he wanted revenge and the next events are a bit contested. It was said he either hired someone to ambush the footman and throw him down the staircase or he did it himself. Either way the footman got royally screwed because he ended up dying from a broken neck and was buried in the home cellar. The next day the Viscount told Lady Louisa that the footman had left in the early morning but she got the feeling something just wasn't quite right. She spent all her waking hours searching the house for him which took a major toll on her body causing her to die from pneumonia mid birth. She died never knowing the true story behind the footman and so people claim they still see the ghost of her on the estate looking for him. Now many have reported seeing a lady in grey in the corridors of the house and near the stairway where he died. Despite this sounding completely made up, they actually found a body in the cellar of the house and it was a male dressed in period footman uniform. So the story checks out and so does the ghost. Why couldn't the Viscount just have asked his wife about the situation like why did the footman have to die? No one had to die in the situation. And that's it for today's video guys. I surprisingly learnt a lot in this video. Usually with myth and legend videos I know a couple of the stories already on the list beforehand but with this one I really didn't know any of them and that's what I wanted. I wanted to do ones we hadn't done before so hopefully I did. Haven't confirmed that though so don't come for me. <laughs> but anyway peeps I'm your host Eamon Hassan and I'll see you next time. Bye!